Okay, so hi guys, Nick here from Conservation Careers and welcome to the podcast. Now in this episode, we're exploring a, a new format, which I hope you'll enjoy. Um, so we've had two years now of doing one-to-one -one podcast interviews and spoken to over 50 amazing conservationists about their careers, the industry, we shared their advice, you know, and I love that. And we're going to continue to do that more and more into the future. However, through the podcast, I've often felt the need um, for some topics to be kind of going deeper into the discussion. There's lots more that myself and I guess want to say about the topic and I often feel like we're just kind of covering the surface. So, and I also wanted to kind of share my advice and other people's advice a bit more and to hear more from other key figures within the kind of wildlife career space. So that's what we're gonna try and do here today. So this is gonna be a new format of the podcast today. Um, what I'm going to do is pick a different topic um, to discuss uh, each fortnight or each month uh, and to help me I've assembled a super team of wildlife career gurus who have kindly agreed to share their thoughts, their experience and their advice. Uh, and if you're a fan of the podcast, you're already going to know them already. So first up <laughs> is my brother from another mother. He's uh, Dr. Fernando Mateus Gonzalez or Nando as he's known. Uh, now Nando and I have worked closely together for the past couple of years. Um, and he's a font of all knowledge and advice and inspiration really for people who are seeking careers, particularly within wildlife conservation biology. And making up this career supergroup is Dr. Stephanie Shuttler um, from the world of fancy scientists. Now Stephanie, she's an unconventional wildlife biologist. She's an entrepreneur, she's a careers advisor. Um, and she spent nearly two decades studying wildlife from all over the globe. Uh, and she's also author of Getting a Job in Wildlife Biology, What It's Like and What You Need to Know. So that's the super team. We're going to cover a different theme each, each month or each episode like this. So welcome, guys. Thanks for joining me. Thank you for the invitation and thank you for those super kind words. Now I feel a lot of pressure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I'm excited to talk to both of you. Thanks for joining, guys. Yeah, it's nice to have a different forum, a different space to be talking, really. So these one-to-one -one interviews that I've had with each of you, I've really enjoyed. You know, I've really enjoyed getting to know you, getting to know all our guests, you know, your career paths, um, hearing how you got to where you are, your, your career highs and lows, the advice you're going to share to others. But as I say, through those discussions, I've often felt like we've had these topics where I want to go deeper. We want to discuss more. You know, I've got stuff I want to say too, actually, as the host, you kind of hold back a little bit. So mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm hoping that through having a forum like this, we can kind of, you know, we can hold those sorts of discussions. And the three of us, because we're all working in a similar space, doing similar things, we can actually kind of get into those details and particularly the things that our audiences are really, really interested in. So, yeah, so thanks again for agreeing to jump in and to kind of to pilot this out and we'll see how it goes. I love it. I love it. it and also, it, doesn't it feel like, or I don't know about you folks, but but it, I'm craving these deep conversations. Mm -hmm. And it's it's also this pandemic year as, at the time we are recording this. I feel, I mean, I live alone and I interact with very few people. And these deeper conversations are, mm, <laughs> I value them a lot. <laughs> yeah, let's get started. Yeah, yeah, it's a COVID thing, isn't it? We're all <laughs> we're all alone, so let's get going. <laughs> In need of interaction. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, so uh, our opening topic, we've had some emails kind of bouncing around. We were thinking about different ideas. One was like, you know, our careers, just sharing our stories a little bit, um, just so the audience kind of has a bit of a reminder, really, as to who we are and why we're talking. Um, and I still think it's worth us just maybe just starting with that, actually, just briefly, if it's OK, just just as kind of introducing ourselves so the audience knows. And then we'll dive into the topic of today, which is all about exploitation in volunteering. But let's not get into that now. Maybe if it's OK, guys, do you mind just just reminding us or more, more to the point, reminding the audience, you know, who you guys are and your backgrounds and, and why you're interested in sharing kind of careers advice in this space? Sure. So I, um, like you mentioned, I've been in this field for almost two decades now, which is crazy because I don't feel like I'm older than like 23. <laughs> but <laughs> <Same> but <here. laughs> um, I guess so I, I had three internships after I graduated and then I got my PhD and I have been doing a long postdoc for the past like six years. And I've worked on elephants, uh, camera trapping. Those are probably my my, my biggest research expertise, but I became really passionate about giving advice for this career because when I started, there was like nothing out there. Um, so, so I graduated in 2003 
And I mean, the internet was around, but it wasn't like what it is today. And um, just my expectations of the career were totally different from what it's actually like. And especially since going through graduate school, like what I thought a scientist was going to be like is just so different than, um, than what it is. And I think that's changed a lot with technology. And we were talking about Bayesian statistics before this with this, <laughs> the advancement of statistics. And I just wanted to um, better prepare people because I, I, I think, I think um, maybe like decade ago or more, you could get a PhD and it would, it would fit you into the, all these different careers, but everything is becoming so much more specialized now. And we're also valuing more education and communication. So jobs like that, they're more interested in those um, people with those specializations rather than scientists who um, can do communication or education. I think it used to be more of that case. So, so yeah, I just became more passionate as I, I've evolved more into a science communicator role now. And I, I basically just wanted to share my knowledge on my blog and it struck a chord with a, with a lot of people. Um, I also struggled to get a job afterwards and I know I wasn't the only one. And I just don't think many people are talking about that. So as I, started my own business I'm like this is a perfect time for me to talk about this yeah yeah absolutely and I, I sort of I totally share that and it, I, I don't know if you feel the same but I feel a real affinity to your story actually in terms of like <laughs> there was a total lack of careers advice 20 years ago about the same for me as well <laughs> yeah I've been in this for about 20 years as well and um yeah and it, it just felt like there's no one out there kind of helping supporting and just sharing honest open effective transparent careers advice Absolutely. you know our, our role my role and you might feel the same is not to kind of glorify this is an amazing place that everyone should be um but it's just to make it more accessible yeah and to make it more honest and transparent to try and provide some guidance and some paths and some clarity as to how to get people as to where they want to be yeah it's fun how we have very very similar i don't know trajectories and and the same feelings because yeah. for me it was also the same i started also my website <laughs> much a much humbler version than yours <laughs> but i started the same way with this uh, okay where do i find information or how can i find jobs and and then organically go, growing into oh now I'm the one that that knows the answers uh, to some of these questions or the places or where to look, and and it felt almost this the same way. It's it's curious and also being in, I guess three different countries and quite separated, mm -hmm. feeling the same process. It's it's curious. Yeah. Did you both get into kind of careers advice, if you like? through your blogs is that where you kind of you've you've got like a resonance with the audience you shared some advice it got well read and that led you more down that track or yeah yes absolutely i started blogging mostly about my research and animals and then i i had this post i it was named something different but now it's seven tips for aspiring wildlife biologists and it was kind of, yeah, just like a big rant of like, why didn't tell anyone tell me like wildlife biology is like, like I said, really about statistics and, and uh, people go into this field thinking like, I actually had a podcast interview yesterday and he was like, what's the most surprising thing about wildlife biologists? And, and I was like, it's a really boring answer. People think you're like bottle feeding animals <laughs> and like, <laughs> you know, trapping them in the field all the time. And really a lot of it is, you know, writing and reading scientific papers and data analysis. Um, so, so yeah, that, that post um, became really popular and I just started building off of it. Yeah, it's interesting. And you too, Nando, is that sort of similar? My it, it's similar. I, I started, I mean, I was egoistic. I started looking for jobs for myself. Mm. And then what happened is that I found many jobs everywhere that I couldn't apply to or, I mean, not possibly. <laughs> so I started sharing them in, in an email list. And when that grew too much, I, I decided, oh, I can just put, post them in a blog. One of these things called blogs, <laughs> which were starting back then. <laughs> and, and then it started growing. People started sending me these jobs to publish them in, in, the, in the blog. And then people started asking questions, asking questions about these applications or these jobs. And as if, as if it was me, the one that was posting them and it was mine the, the responsibility to hire these people 
But some of these questions I, I could reply already. I do, I'm not the one hiring, but I know this person, or I'm not the one hiring, but uh, I could advise you to do this. And then so many emails started coming that I thought, okay, I will just write it and, and put it as, as your post, Stephanie. I will put tips to, I don't know, all of these questions. And then against all my predictions, more people continued writing because they wanted to know more. And, and it started, it, it was almost organic like that. And the proof is that <laughs> my, my blog is still in, in Blogspot. It's like I keep on not paying anything for it and very, very bare bones. But still now I, I get so many visits and so many offers for doing interesting stuff. And, and well, it got me here too, like to, yeah. to meet you guys and, and serve this moment. It's really interesting, isn't it? Yeah. It's funny, I, I, think, I think I've come things, at things from a slightly different angle to you guys in that sense, actually. That's where conservation careers came from, from my side was um, I was working out in the Pacific um, doing fundraising for BirdLife International. And I was moving back to the UK um, with my wife. And actually we came back because we wanted to start a family and all that sort of stuff. And we wanted to be close to home and all that, you know. And so we'd been out there for a couple of years. I was coming back and I was, I was sort of back recruiting for my job. So, you know, I, I made my vacancy, you know, listing. I advertised it on all the kind of big websites that were at that time. And, and we just didn't get, we actually didn't get many good responses. We didn't get many people apply and it was a good job. I was really having a good time, you know, working for a nice organization. I, I was expecting like a, you know, a bombardment, a tidal wave of applications. And I think we got something like 12 applications of which to be honest, two or three were, you know, interview worthy, you know, and, and it just kind of, it shocked me slightly. I thought there's, there's, there is a gap in the market here because I was also looking to start my own enterprise at the same time. So I was looking for ideas, you know, and, and obviously I'm into wildlife conservation. I'm into helping people. These are kind of really important things to me. And the ideas coalesced around, well, why don't, why don't, why not start a, an international conservation job board, a place where we put all the jobs internationally. I felt there were really good websites in the UK and in the U S and elsewhere, but there wasn't really a site for advertising these international jobs where people are kind of moving around the globe and, there's lots of people moving around the globe in, in, in wildlife conservation. So I thought, well, I'll do that. And then it, then it became like a keyword analysis in Google, right? Okay, so what are the keywords that people are searching for here? What are the domain names that are available? You know, and conservation jobs being a you know, big keyword, but it was being used, you know, and looked like it was a good idea. Conservation careers wasn't being used. Good search volume and really relevant. And I thought, actually, you know what? Careers advice is so much more interesting than just jobs. Jobs sits within that. Yeah. But uh, rather than just listing jobs, we need much more than that. We need to be helping people who are looking for, you know, conservation jobs. And I've been asked loads of times, how do I get a job in wildlife conservation? And it just felt like all these jigsaw pieces fell into place for me. <laughs> you know, it's oh, like, nice. oh, <laughs> it's conservation career. I can see loads of ways in which that could create huge impact and help people help the world world and be, you know, an interesting, you know, enterprise to be growing. So that's kind of where my seed came from so i guess you, you saw you saw it in the stats in your blogs i saw it in the stats in google mm -hmm. that's probably the link <laughs> that's a great way to approach it yeah it's yeah yeah and it's i, I just got I, I think in many ways it was um I, not fate but it was luck yeah i think it was luck a little bit the, the, the idea kind of just landed at the right time for me just exactly the right time when i could do it mm -hmm. as a side hustle as well so you know it's a one day a week two day a week and so on you know it allowed me to transfer across Oh, well, it's great. I, we should probably mention, I'm in the UK. Stephanie, you're in the US, right? Mm -hmm. Whereabouts in the yep. US are you? Raleigh, North Carolina. So East Coast, a little nice. bit South. Cool. <laughs> and Nando, although you're Spanish, you are in? I'm in the middle. Well, not the middle. <laughs> I'm close to the border with Austria in the Czech Republic. Right. In a small village. <laughs> yeah. And, and just, I just realized, Stephanie, I, I was there in Raleigh. Uh, oh, really? I, a friend of mine was living there at the time. <laughs> no, so I know the place. How curious. <laughs> <laughs> well, come back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, hopefully. It's a great place to live. I love it here. 
Yeah, yeah. I can't wait. I can't wait. <laughs> be nice to travel again, won't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it'll be interesting through these conversations, actually. Uh, conservation is a small world, a really small world. Mm -hmm. And the connections are so, I mean, we're, we're bound to know loads of people in common. So let's, <laughs> we'll pick them out as we go. <laughs> so, uh, so this is the first episode. So we've chosen the theme of um, volunteering conservation volunteering is a real hot topic right now something that we're all thinking really about tough. a lot something our audience feel really mm -hmm. passionate about that we share and we're conscious about too and i think within volunteering um there is this um discussion around kind of exploitation um and whether you should pay to volunteer whether that in itself is exploitation whether um, whether it discriminates against people who you know have less money or less access to opportunities as a result, making conservation more elitist, I guess. You know, if only the, if only the rich can kind of pay to get into the sector through paid experiences, is that a fair? Does that discriminate against people from different backgrounds as well? It's a big topic, right? I mean, it feels like a big topic to be biting <laughs> off in the first episode, but I do think it's a really a really interesting place for us to kind of start these discussions from. Um, so I guess kicking things off, a, a good place for us to start maybe is just to kind of talk about um, what is volunteering, I guess, just as a leveller, and, and why might people be interested in volunteering, like why do people volunteer, you know, before we kind of go off into the other areas we might want to explore, but yeah, who, who wants to pick up, you know, what, what is volunteering, let's, let's start there, what's, what's a good description as to what, what it covers? It's a big, it's a big topic to cover, but so I, I mean, I would describe volunteering as, as performing any kind of task or duty for a person or an organization. And usually the person is with an organization. So if it, if it's like, you're doing it for a graduate student, they're with a university. Um, but for, for no compensation, no monetary compensation, um, you should at least expect to have a recommendation or, or um, a reference, um, maybe a letter of recommendation. There might be some other things you could get in exchange, like a, like a, like a journal article, depending on what you work on. But, um, but yeah, there's no monetary compensation. And th this happens at different levels. Um, so, so I don't know if you guys watch Tiger King, but mm. Tiger King exposed, or exposed, I should put in quotes, um, that the sanctuary and Tiger King, they made it look like they were using volunteers. And in that case, so nonprofits don't make a lot of money and um, it, you know, it saves them money if people are willing to donate their time to help feed the animals and clean cages and things like that. In that case, they made it look like they're exploiting the volunteers, but those volunteers for the most part looked older. I believe they're probably retirees, people who really care about the cats and are wanting to donate their time. And where it becomes a problem in our field is that I personally don't think you can get a job. Not, now, this is not the way I want it to be, but I, don't, I think it's extremely hard or almost impossible to get a job without any volunteer experience. Because in order to get that first position to get paid, you need experience. And um, usually that comes from volunteering. And, and yeah, the big problem is, it, is that it's a prerequisite or seems to be a prerequisite for, for jobs. And um, like you mentioned, only like wealthier people have an advantage because they don't have to, um, they might not have to work to support themselves in college. Uh, where, where, or it might be okay where you get college credit for it. I have seen that before where you volunteer in a lab at your university and it counts as part of your college curriculum. So that, that could be another way, a workaround without getting paid. But, um, but yeah, that's the biggest problem that I see. And then, as you mentioned, it excludes, um, um, it, yeah, excludes different, um, people of different backgrounds because of the, the wealth issue. Yeah. And I guess in terms of, and well, yeah, and, there, and there's also volunteering, like we, we talked about, I think you mentioned the paid to volunteer. So there's programs like, like Earthwatch, which I think are fantastic. They are these, these like vacations where you can go to really cool places, work on really cool animals, even, even endangered species, which, which normally people can't get close to or touch. And they pay to be part of that experience, but they're under the supervision of a scientist and the scientist is, um, 
you know, leading all the data collection and everything. But people, I met people who did Earthwatch and they were just like so happy to contribute to conservation and support that project. And they had these great experiences, but they were not in this, this field at all. They were just, I like, I, they had a job at a bank or something. And this was like their cool mm -hmm. way to, to interact with the animals and help out. Exactly. That, that's a holiday, right? This. Yeah. This, holiday. Yeah. We have all these, all these different kinds of things that we call volunteering, but actually are very, very different and cover and give different values to different people that are looking for different things. Mm -hmm. that, like, and that's, yeah, that's a big part of it, isn't it really? Is it feels like, as you described, it's, like, it, it's such a big, broad area of volunteering. It's quite hard to pin down and define super clearly because we use it in different ways. The, the way I kind of view it as well, which is very similar to you, Stephanie, is, um, I sort of see three three different areas really. One is like um, I guess we might call it like interning classically. So you would you would be like almost like embedded, almost like an unpaid member of staff Apprentice. within an organization. <laughs> what was that? Apprentice. Apprentice, uh, yeah, it's a good way of putting it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like an apprenticeship almost. Like you're not getting paid, but you're sat literally behind the desk or in the field, you know, almost shadowing another person and helping them and doing a really, you know, as good a job as you can and learning through that experience. And you're embedded within it. So it's like you're a member of staff. You've been treated like that member of staff and you're getting a good experience, hopefully, as a result. You can call that volunteering, I guess. Another one would be you're sort of volunteering your time, often like to help a cause or to learn some skills or whatever, but often more like in the field, you know, so it could be in the evenings or weekends. Mm -hmm. It's a bit more flexible. You know, for us in the UK, we have like the wildlife trusts and the conservation volunteers, TCB and things like that, and university kind of volunteer groups. Something I did at university was I'd go out every weekend and would be out on the nature reserves felling trees or digging ponds or whatever it might be. That was volunteering for me, like hands on stuff, getting experience, having fun, getting some skills, you know, but I'm not interning. It's, it's different. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not acting like a member of staff. I'm just supporting someone for a short period and then going away again and coming again, maybe next week for a little bit. Um, and then the last one, as you described as well, is like um, these kind of often overseas experiences, um, which I see often as like more like training, you know, when done really well, I think they're more training courses mm -hmm. actually, but the term volunteering is used. And I think it's used from a marketing perspective a lot actually, because it, it grabs attention. Because again, through Google keyword analysis, probably, you know, people have looked mm -hmm. at search volumes and realized, actually, if we call this a training experience, you know, people come, they get experience in radio tracking or whatever the skills are that you're going to learn through that experience for one, two, three weeks, or even months sometimes in quite, you know, interesting exotic locations, you know, game reserves in South Africa or the reefs of the Seychelles or whatever it might be. Um, but these are training experiences. You come in, you're shadowing a scientist who teaches you these skills, someone who's really good at these things, whatever they are, under the assumption that you're going to get skilled at them too and become more employable as a result. Um, but it's not really volunteering in my view, that stuff. That, that to me is training it's a training course and you pay for that you know that's the whereas the others you don't pay for usually you wouldn't pay to be an intern and in in you wouldn't pay to be a volunteer on the reserves in fact sometimes you'll get paid you know like some of these internships mm -hmm. are paid as well as that this, that end of the spectrum so I feel like yeah. it's a confusing space to be in volunteering I think some of the frustrations that we see and hear and feel come as a result of of this word that's used in the, so many different ways. The wrong, the wrong branding, no? <laughs> like calling it volunteering. I think in part I call it volunteering because, because it, it adds a value. Like volunteering makes you feel good. If you are not only learning, but helping, it's, that's, that's a nice value. And that's why, well, that's the marketing in it, no? Yeah. Oof. Yeah, yeah and some of those international experiences, I like, I know what you mean. Some of them seem to be more like, pr like trainings and programs, but then there are experiences where like professors have a field site and they need people to like do monkey observations or something. I've seen, I remember this one advertisement, it would come up like every year and they made it sound so awful that like only the, the people who really wanted it would, would get <laughs> it, but they talked about <laughs> 
yeah, they talked about like monkeys pooping on you and the bugs being terrible and everything. But I remember that one. I think you you either got paid like two dollars a day or you had to pay two dollars a day. But that that's probably because that they don't have the funds from a from a grant to be able to cover those those um, those volunteers. And and I think I think also for most of us, like we don't really want to have volunteers. We would love to pay people, especially for like these internships and these, these more structured programs, the, the like weekend birding stuff or the weekend, like helping out might be a little bit different, but, um, but it comes from like, just that there's not a lot of money in conservation in, in research, unless you're in like medical research. Um, and, and yeah, it's, it's deciding like, do I, have less data or do I have there, or does this project take me longer to do, or do I have somebody who is eager to help me? And, and as a scientist, I would actually get emails either myself or my, my boss got them really frequently saying like, how can I help out? And I, I encourage people to reach out, like saying mm-hmm. if there's any volunteer opportunities. So it's like, if you have someone who's willing to help out and, do you, I mean, do you decline them? Cause that's, that's also kind of strange because they want to get this experience. Mm. Um, so mm. it's, it's tough from both angles. It is. And it, it feels like it should be a win-win really, shouldn't it? It should be a win for the employer, the person who's offering the opportunity and getting the work done as a result, mm-hmm. you know, and it should certainly be a win for the volunteer because, you know, they, they should be getting more out than they put in. And I think that's a really important distinction in, in volunteering as to where the exploitation line is. <laughs> Yeah, if yeah. if you you know, and, and that's so personal, and it, it comes back to a few things. But one of the one of the first things I think it comes back to for me is like you know why why are you volunteering in the first first place? Like what you're looking to get out of it. So it might be that you want to volunteer because because you want to become more employable. You know, that's often a, a core driver. You need you you need some experience. You need some evidence on your CV. Yes, you might have learned it at university or college or wherever, and it, mm-hmm. it, you know, and just learning something in a classroom doesn't mean you can actually do it and you can't prove to an employer you can right. do that thing you need exactly. hands-on practical experience of you know your successes right the evidence of what you've actually achieved with this knowledge that you've gained and one way of doing that is volunteering so that's a kind of core driver for me for a lot of people I volunteer because you know I really want to build my employability you know but there's loads of other reasons as to why you might volunteer you might volunteer because you want to network and meet like-minded people who might you know offer you jobs and other things in return, I guess, in the future. Uh, you might just want to have fun, have a nice holiday, you know, have a nice trip, mm-hmm. and it, it, nothing wrong with that. Um, you might want to like test drive a job, something you might be interested in. Mm-hmm. You know, I think I like communications and marketing, but I'm not sure. But by doing that for a few weeks as a vol or an intern, you're going to know yes or no whether it's right for you or not. Gosh, I feel like the heavens are open. Look at the lights over here. <laughs> <laughs> we see you shining. Yeah. I'm getting darker over here. <laughs> yeah, I'll pull that down again. Um, and and I guess there's loads of other reasons as to why people might sort of go into volunteering. And that and that all then throws into the balance as to whether this is going to be a, a positive outcome for you or not. I mean, for me, exploitation, I guess, happens when when you you kind of you've put more in than you feel you've got out and that kind of comes back to that sort of win-win thing I just touched on so I see it as like an equation nowadays I think in terms of like looking at like return on investment right so I'm going to invest as a volunteer my time for sure that's what it's all about but also I may choose to invest some money as well I mean you don't have to pay and we can get into that in a bit but um you know those are the kind of two th- two resources I'm putting into this thing you know um for sure and as a result, I hope to get something out of this. And that might be fun. It might be travel. It might be employability or whatever it might be. So two people can go to the same situation, the same volunteer experience, the exact same volunteer experience. And from one of them, it, it was almost exploitation in terms of there was a lot of money, you know, which they didn't have. Let's say as a graduate, you know, coming out of grad school, don't have much money. And they go to a place, a volunteer experience in let's say in Namibia, radio tracking meerkats, right? To pick an example. So a graduate, you know, spends 500 pounds for two weeks radio tracking meerkats in Namibia um, because she wants experience of radio tracking animals because she knows that's going to make her more employable. And then someone else might go to that exact same thing. Let's say an IT manager from London who's got a wife and kids and wants just two weeks away going, uh, spending more time more closely with meerkats because, you know, he loves them and he wants to kind of just almost have um, a, a, quite a cheap holiday in a sense, you know, doing something that's quite fun. 
same mm-hmm. experience. You know, the IT manager might come out of those two weeks and think, I had a blast. Didn't cost me that much, relatively speaking, because he's got lots of money, but not much time. Um, you know, and I got close to me because I met some lovely people in a great place and had a great experience, you know. Whereas actually the, the, the graduate might come away thinking, well, I, I did this experience, spent a lot of money on it, but actually maybe the training wasn't up to the level I wanted. And I didn't mm-hmm. get, you know, the, the, the radio tracking didn't have the right equipment. The person who was teaching me wasn't that great, you know, and actually I've walked away and I've not really more employable as a result. And so it feels like there's lots of things in the mix there. It's like, how much time have you got? How much money have you got? And what do you want to get out of there? And for me, by looking at it as like a return on investment thing, then, you know, you can really start to identify whether this experience is going to be right for you personally, but also I think we can start to kind of figure out where that exploitation line might be, you know, in the sector. Yeah. Really. And, then, it, and then on top, sorry, and on top of, of that layer, layer you described, the individual reasons and the individual effects, then we put on top the, we should have brought here an economist, but, but the effect that the decisions of these people have in the field as a whole and, and the persons that offer those volunteering or, or those opportunities. It's, it's like the, the tragedy of the commons, like you, you decide to do something by yourself or because it's good for yourself to get more experience, for example, and you are willing to, to apply to one of these even paid volunteering. And by doing so, you are lowering the prices of the wages. Right. It's, it's so complicated. It's such a um, ecosystem of, of effects. And that's yeah. why it's so difficult. <laughs> I've seen scientists post on Twitter that they won't they won't accept volunteers for that reason because they don't want to like cheapen the field essentially. But when I think of exploitation, um, another in addition to what you what you said about the the, the equation, um, I I actually think a lot about how people are treated, and I I have not gone through this experience personally, but I had Stephanie Martin on my podcast, and um, who else talked about it? I can't, somebody else t- um, talked about it. Maybe it was um, Laura, but. Like a lot of these experiences, because there, there's so many people who are willing to come, willing to pay, especially for these like really charismatic species or really cool locations, that the the scientists can kind of treat these employees, you know, poorly. And people have been um, like yelled at or working like you know 14 hour days, um, really isolated, and it it just takes like a big toll on them mentally or have even had to deal with like sexual harassment or um, other types of unfair working conditions. I think that's actually pretty common in our field as well, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah we've yeah, heard lots of the, stories like the that. The ones that create companies to, to, to create a need, a, f- a fake need, like, ah, oh, let's rescue poor lions, but they are actually taking lions from the wild and breeding them and bringing people, volunteers, to, to feed them with bottles, but they are just kept in cages and it's a farm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then they, there's they that, come yeah. from this. <laughs> there's a, that yeah. tourism volunteering where, where people, yeah, where it's like scam sanctuaries. Like you have to be very careful volunteering at sanctuaries and vet it because, I mean, this, this happens especially with elephants in, in Asia where people think that they are, they're helping these elephants, but really they were put in this park called a sanctuary so people could take pictures of them with for Instagram and it's not a real sanctuary is in my opinion really separate the animals from the people and they they prioritize animals because animals they don't wild animals they don't really want to they don't want to hang out with us even if they're captive they they want to do animal things they don't want to be cuddled and <laughs> that's that's not their nature that doesn't help. <laughs> <laughs> right so yeah so people definitely need to stay away from from those schemes yeah. but um and those that, yeah. a bit like you both said about the sort of self-fulfilling nature of that too like you know um mm-hmm. i think another concern within the sector is when people uh or when when there are projects running whereby you're collecting data as part of that project you know and that might be reef health or something else whatever it might be you know um, but it's just collecting data for data's sake. <laughs> you know, it's like, yes. wh- why have we been doing this for 10 or 20 years? How has the data been used? For what purpose? 
you know, is it? Are we just here just to collect data for the sake of it? So you've created an experience that this is somehow part of the training, or is there a deeper reason behind the, you know, for this? Is the data used? Has it been published? Is it is it shared in some way? You know, what is it? What is it? What's being done with this data? I think I see that, and that that always. I hate that idea. You're just doing it for the sake of it. And, and it's been doing it like this for a decade Wasting or more. Wasting of resources and people yeah. and energy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. But yeah, I mean, we we have also seen at our side, like the, yeah, the kind of exploitation of individuals as well, which is the kind of the nasty side of this, to be honest. Yeah. Um, and I can't name individuals or, or corp businesses or whatever it might be, but there are organizations we don't work with, <laughs> you know, because people have shared stuff about these organizations, which exactly as you described, Stephanie. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Individuals just being used as, or for want of a better word, slaves, to be honest. Yeah. Just, you know, yeah. long hours, isolation um, and really not being respected as individuals. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I even know people who think of like poor compensation as being exploitation as well. Like I saw a, a job posting, it was like a part-time position on Twitter and I think it paid $2,000 for a year and people were, you know, outraged by that. It, like I said, it wasn't a full-time position, but they felt that that was exploitive as well because you're taking somebody who has skills and you're not paying them the, the value that, that they're worth and you're essentially taking advantage of them. And then the other person might take a job like that, hoping that they can build up their resume and um, increase their network or something like that. So it's, yeah, it's a, it's a big problem. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a real, it kind of shows the complexity of it too, because taking that example, imagine if you were like a conservation charity, a small, I mean, you're a small conservation charity, Nando, you work for a, a small charity, right? Alka, right? Who you work yes, for. Yes, Alka Wildlife. In <laughs> Alka Wildlife in the Czech Republic. Let's say you need some communications work doing a communications fundraising marketing person, but you have zero budget for it, which might be the reality, I don't know, <laughs> you know, but let's say you can um, scrape together $2,000, right? you know, for someone to come in and do some work for you, which is better than nothing, <laughs> you know, and there's someone out there who would love the experience of coming in and helping you with your communications and marketing, take your charity to the next level, get some experience and $2,000 is a lot better than nothing, you know, is yeah, that exploitation? It totally or is... fair. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, this is a problem to having, having to decide case by case, almost apart from these extremes that we have talked about. This is a case by case thing. And another thing, um, before Stephanie, you, you mentioned you mentioned that for sure in our field, uh, volunteering is almost a must. And, and I, <laughs> I have suffered or enjoyed, depending on how you look at it, that that truth. And and then later, later Nick said that he described this example where a person goes to to try and get radio tracking experience. I think this leads to, to one of the sources of the problem, which is why we don't get this training and practice during our education, mm -hmm. like in other, in other jobs and professions. There are other jobs and professions that are completely ready after their university stage or other, other kinds of education. And our field is so special that we don't get ready uh, when we go out. We, we are just at the beginning. It's like we have to learn a completely new set of skills to, mm. in order to get that job. I totally so agree. actually, I do think, though, that some people are trained. Like I have seen students, I've, I've been looking at students' resumes and they list their courses and stuff like that. So I do see some students that come with that training. But I think that it's just the field is so saturated that there's so many people out there. And um, I think, Nick, Nick you were you're talking about this too. Like, as an employer, I might not trust like what they learn in school. So if they wrote like small mammal trapping, does that mean they had a class where they watched the professor small mammal trapped and they learned the concept? Whereas if somebody has on their experience, like they small mammal trapped for a whole, a whole field season for several months, that to me so it says that they have more experience in small mammal trapping, that they can actually do it on their own. So I think that that is more of the issue that there's just so much more competition that, that usually you can, you can pick somebody who has more experience than, than you, even if you got the training in school. And that's, you, that's you why I tell it. students, huh? Sorry, Sorry, go ahead. You, you said it that, that 
you as an employer wouldn't trust the education part. It's so curious. Like in other, I don't know, a lawyer, <laughs> maybe, well, maybe they do get to practice somewhere, mm. but, but sometimes yeah. universities have this aura of, of expertise and then, oh, we get a graduate from Harvard in law school or, and then those you will trust, but we don't, I mean, we, potential employers don't trust what people might have done in their university years. Yeah. And I think that, that comes again to the problem. It's like, if, where, is, where, is, where does this trust come from and why is not better? Well, I think part of it is, part of it comes down to the individual as to how they put their evidence on their applications, their CV right. resumes. You know, if you just put, I did mammal trapping, that tells me nothing. <laughs> how much exactly. can you quantify, qualify? What was the outcome? There's loads more that, that would help me as the employer to gauge how good they are, what their experience is. If you've done six months and caught 5,000 sort of slicks or field wells or whatever it might be, then great. Um, but then the other side, I think, I, I think when I sort of reflect on it a little bit more is I think, I think there's a lot of courses um, that are perhaps not training people for the wider conservation sector. So we're very good at training scientists, mm. yeah. you know, zoologists, biologists, whatever you want to call them. You know, you come out of university, you're a half decent university and you will understand the scientific method and you'll know how to do field surveys and you pre have a good grasp of stats nowadays and everything you need is those skill sets within that area. But who's training conservation communicators? Who's training conservation project managers? Who's training conservation fundraisers and all the other roles that are within this vast field, this sector, you know, and I think what, what universities probably should do a bit more of is, is embedding those sorts of trainings within their courses. So if you're doing a, certainly a wildlife conservation course, you should be, you should, you know, this is, these, are the, these are, when we, when we look across all the job types and we review what employees are looking for, project management, communications, fundraising, I mean, those are almost like the big three, to be honest. There are others as well. You know, can you work in a team and manage deadlines and all this sort of stuff? But, you know, if if you trained people, you know, in scientific principles and those three things as well it, during university courses, you're going to be more employable as a result, you know. And, and I don't see many courses that have those built in at all, actually, really. So I think there's a bit of a gap there. You are so right. And that is a big reason why I wrote my book, because when I was looking for jobs, I was like, OK, I want to work for a nonprofit. And when I was looking at the nonprofits, like all of the jobs were in fundraising and marketing. And I was like, where are the like science jobs? And I, I, not, I don't have any fundraising experience, so I'm not competitive for those jobs. And and um I do wish like in graduate school, somebody said, well, if you want to work for a nonprofit, you should maybe get some fundraising skills because even I work, I work with wildlife insights right now and um, we're trying to get funded. So all like scientists on the projects are the ones trying to find funders. So, mm -hmm. so even though they're scientists, still part of their job is, is trying to get funding for the, the project. Um, but I just wanted to add real quick, when you talked about students putting things on their resume, yeah, I totally agree with you. You can have like small mammal trapping experience in a course. And if you're applying for a small mammal trapping job and the student says like, you know, we went on a week long small mapping, small mammal trapping trip. Like to me, that would say like, okay, they can, they can do it. Maybe not as much as a three months, but, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you need to, you need to explain like how, um, how competent you are to do things on your own. That, that's what I think that students fail to do. Like I see a lot of times like camera trapping just written on their, their manuscript or on their resume. And it's like, well, what does that mean? Do they set up 50 camera traps? Do they look at the pictures? Did they identify animals or did they just, you know, set up one? Yeah. yeah. And actually I think that swings us back quite nicely to volunteering actually. So, you know, when people are kind of choosing volunteer placements and if you're doing it because you're trying to become more employable, you're trying to get some specific skills. Let's say you want to do mammal trapping. Maybe you know you really want to get into mammal trapping, from, you know, from a conservation perspective, <laughs> not because you want to hurt them. Um, and and you've identified that as a gap in your knowledge. Employers are looking for this. You don't have it, and volunteering is the way to fill that gap. Uh, maybe radio tracking is a better example in this respect. You know, the meerkats, the radio tracking before. Um, then you need to be really clear, I think, when you're choosing your project, what radio tracking experience are you going to get? Mm -hmm. 
is it going to be like a couple of hours, you know, over several weeks? Are you going to be doing any? Are you going to be watching other people doing it? Are you going to learn to a point where you're teaching other people? What equipment are you going to be using? What species will you be tracking? Is this the stuff that employers are looking for? How will you be analyzing the data? I think you really need to be clear what you really want to get out of it that you know employers are looking for. Like really understand the employer requirements and where your gaps are and then find the experience, the volunteering um, that's going to give you those specific things. And, and you've got to therefore do your research, you know, so before you sign up for a project, drill them, you know, drill them on exactly what's going to happen and what you're going to get. Because again, the exploitation happens for me when the, the experience just doesn't meet up to what, what you expected it to be. Almost like you were missold or the marketing wasn't right or there was something in, you know, in that so you walk away thinking, well, that wasn't what I was hoping for. It wasn't as good. And, you know, then then the balance has been tipped, actually. In that, that, that. Even worse, when you think it was good because you don't know what's needed. Yeah. <laughs> that also happens. Like, I think we are training or we, I think people come out to the job market uh, thinking that it's enough to have a, a brand, a name, a name of a, a profession. In, on the other side, you have the employers looking only for the skills. More and more mm. employers don't care about qualifications or titles or, or the actual name of what you studied. And there is this class, like people go, hey, I have this. And that's exactly why they don't describe it in their CV. And they, they just say, I have this. And it should prove already that I have studied during four years and done this master's right. with this name in this university. But to the employers, maybe also because they are older, <laughs> that doesn't mean anything. They don't know that master's mm -hmm. or they don't know what's behind that. So there is this mismatch, complete mismatch. And now I think volunteering the way you describe it, Nick, is, is the best. Like what exactly is missing in my skill set and mm -hmm. how I can get it and prove it. Also, not only said I've done this uh, name XX course, but I've done exactly this project with these results. Yeah. And that, yeah. and, that and, will and change get the... And get the skills for the, the jobs you want too. Like I'm, I'm part of these wildlife Facebook groups and I see a lot of people post like, I have this, like, what should I work on? What should I add? And it's like, well, you know, and people will comment like GIS and I guess GIS is pretty good to have for most jobs, but mm -hmm. it's like, well, don't get, you know, bird banding experience if you never want to work with the birds. Like, like don't just get all of these skills. Like you like figure out as best as you can what you want to do and then, um, and then fill in the gaps. Mm -hmm. And um, just going back to the exploitation, I think it's important, like you're talking about the students knowing um, what they're gonna get out of it. I think it's important for, for students or applicants to know that they have rights as well. So when they get the job, I, I always sit down with anyone I'm mentoring and go over expectations. But if their mentor is not doing that, that they can request that, that, you know, okay, like what, like, what are my responsibilities and duties and everything, but also ask, like, you know, are there opportunities to work on a research paper or, or give a talk at a conference, things like that. Like they, like if a student, I, I mean, I go over that with my students, but if they brought that up to me, I would be like, oh, wow, you know, they're really showing initiative, no, no matter what the answer is. And you, and they might have something for you that, you know, maybe they are not even thinking of. Yeah. Yeah, that's great advice. Yeah. And I think, again, it's it's sort of beholden on the individual to get the most out of their experience and yeah. to show themselves in the best in the best light. Yeah. We sort of say, you know, when you do a volunteer and internship, you know, absolutely make the most of it. You know, if someone gives you a task, do it to the best of your ability, obviously reflect, you know, on what you could have done better, maybe, you know, and, and always kind of try and find more ways to help your role. I mean, obviously, you're trying to get skills and experiences out of this, but really your role is there is to help that employer and through that you're going to get the bigger return. So sort of putting your best foot forwards you know, is, is so important. And I mean, it's not, there's no guarantees in this world, but you know, you hear a lot, you know, people who are a good volunteer, they often go on to become the staff later down the line, you know, you become embedded, you get your feet under the table, right? And so you've really got to, yeah, to maximize that opportunity. And Another thing on, on the expectations uh, that is interesting is, is the other side, that many people want to go to these volunteers because it's the shiny part and it's exciting to be with the animals, for example. And, and then 
you have to realize that that's only a very, very small part of the whole job. <laughs> and the same as we were describing before, like we are training in university, for example, to be a scientist, but half of the of the job is missing because you need to learn how to do the job, the scientific job, but also how to get the money to fund the, mm. the job. And that we don't get it. So, so this expectation when, when volunteers said, I, I've been volunteering so much and I still don't get a job. Often, and not always, but often I, I see that it's because they are missing much more, like all the, all the other skills and things you need to actually work in. For example, one of the places I work, like you really need to be working and doing the research and at the same time applying for the next next founding round because if not you cannot continue the work right. that, that's a that's a, one of our problems is that we don't uh, in 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 quotes produce we we conserve <laughs> and the problem with conservation is that it doesn't produce riches at least uh, officially but we know that it does mm. but that's a problem when when getting funding yeah Conservation is a, ba a bad word. It maintaining status quo isn't making it yeah, better. Exactly. Is it? So let's just keep it all as it is, everyone. <laughs> we should call it impro. Yeah, improve, improving. Also, enhancement. Improvement. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, but I love I love that that phrase you just said. Um, half the job is missing. I think that yeah. encapsulates actually a lot of the training that's out there. Yeah, yeah. and the, the courses that you touched on. Yeah, so well, I think that that's absolutely true. But I think also, you know, through particularly during your university years, if you're at uni or college or whatever it might be, that is a great time outside of your studies to be trying to get some hands on experience. And there's loads of ways of doing that. I mean, I was lucky that we had a conservation volunteer group at uni which I got really involved with. And I spent more time volunteering than I did in, in my lectures because I enjoyed it. I and mean, that's, a, you know, if you don't enjoy it, that tells you something as well. <laughs> um you know, but obviously you've got, you know, you've got the holidays and the, the term breaks and everything else where you can be trying to, you know, secure experience and going out there and, and getting some hands on practical stuff. And it might be that your um, your tutors, your course leaders, they can help to connect you to opportunities as well if you, you know, if you don't know where they are and what they might be. So that's yeah. But you're right. I mean, I do feel like there's a gap within education that you touched on that we need to broaden the education skill set or broaden the skills we're giving to people who are graduating out there to make sure they really are employable for the jobs that exist and not the jobs that existed 20, 30 years ago. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I was just thinking about um, like what you said, Nando, with like, we don't, like employers don't trust the, the school. Mm. And I think, I actually think that one of the solutions, and this is especially true for including diversity, um, because you know there's all these people with experience, and the the wealthier people essentially can pay for a more volunteer experience, whether it's an actual paid circumstance or not. So, as employers, one of the things that that we can do is not weigh experience as much, and or or look at the types of experience applicants are getting. If they have a lot of volunteer experience, you know, is that because they can essentially afford to with the time and, and um, um, yeah, not getting compensated for that. And somebody else who doesn't have experience, maybe it's just because they had to work full time for, for their, um, for their college degree and, and their survival. So that's, that's something else that um, can help solve the problem. Yeah, I agree. I've been thinking that another reason is that the curriculum is outdated, the, the, this way mm -hmm. of hiring that is, mm -hmm reading something i think we should go more it will be better for everybody through projects mm -hmm. what have you done in your free time uh, with or without money within your reach to prove that you you will be good at doing this job many people want to go and volunteer in africa and and do this internship with elephants but actually i value or i would value more as an employer people that look around in in their neighborhood and then fix things there mm. and improve things there and and use their free time the weekend time to to create something new or write wherever in a notebook write something and demonstrate it that way and if i see that um that going forward that that willing to do things that for me at least it has has much more value than any paid volunteer or any 
qualification. And I, th I see it. Well, we are seeing it more in the, all the bigger companies in Google and Facebook, and, and they, are, they are stopping to, to look at qualifications. So maybe that is the trend. Yeah. Maybe I, I, one of the best ways of hiring stuff, I would think, is actually test the skills in interview. Don't say you can do it written format. Don't even just sit here and say, I can do trapping, whatever it is. You know, actually test. If you're going to be hiring someone for years to come, this new member of staff and really investing in them, not just time, Absolutely. money, everything else that comes with that. Test the skills. I remember when I, I um, applied for a job as a communications manager at BirdLife, and one of the things I had to do was write news stories and press releases. That was like a core part of the job, you know get a lot of information from research papers and other places and try and spin it in something which people would find interesting and exciting and engaging and in interviews said right now you've got 30 minutes here's you know five papers about the barley starling it's critically endangered bird you know, can you write as a press release on it and come back in half an hour and they just sat me down with a laptop and some <laughs> text <laughs> you know yeah. so I had to quickly read and think and then write something and I thought what well, you know that, that is brilliant you should do that really it's putting you on the spot but you know, if, 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 if this is a really important skill, if you're going to need to know our statistics or whatever, you should sit someone down with a task that you'll be doing day to day and actually test that skill. And almost it doesn't matter what, what's written on your CV anymore. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah, interviews you will be longer. <laughs> it's like that. Can you do the job? <laughs> Ex exactly. Do the job. Yeah. Maybe do like an apprentice. No, no, don't do that. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. You sort of, you know, people could do the job for a day and the person who did the best job. I don't know. There must be other ways of exploring. I'm kind of interested in that idea. Yeah. Mm. yeah one thing we touched on a couple of times actually um which we wanted to talk about too in a bit more detail is this idea of of diversity and whether the kind of pay to play sector of the market the paid volunteering you pay the money you get the experience whether that is biasing you know the, the market for people out there you know are the people with deeper pockets from more affluent wealthy backgrounds perhaps you know therefore getting access to more opportunities and doing better in the market I, 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 I can sort of see both sides. Um, I think if you've got, uh, to me, um, thinking about it, I think, I think the, the paid end of the market is almost like the easy end of the market. You know, it's, it's almost in, ways, in some ways the lazy end of the market too, to be honest. It, you know, there's different ways of getting experiences. And one is just to buy it off the shelf, you know, and and it's if you pick really well and you understand your gaps and you pick a project that you can pay for and it gives you those experiences really well, then you're onto a winner, really. And then you can afford it. And that will speed well, you up. Well, some of those are, are really competitive, though. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, some of them are. Absolutely. And some yeah. of them are not, actually. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So they might be limited. Yeah. Um, and then there's the other end whereby actually you identify the skills and your needs and whatever that might be. And then you identify the people, individuals, organizations who can help you with those skills and provide you those training as a volunteer. And you kind of connect with them. You network with them. You, you, know, you do your research. I need to do some communications. Well, I need to be able to manage a social media channel you know, to, for a campaign. That's what I want to achieve. That's what employees are telling me. And you think, well, who's really good at doing social media campaigns in this space? Well, WWF are great. They've got Earth Hour. What if I could get an intern internship doing Earth Hour for WWF? So you contact the manager of that, you know, and, and make a connection. And that then leads to a volunteer and internship. Um, I would argue, I and mean, that's free. It shouldn't cost you. I mean, it might, it might cost you time and money in terms of moving to a place. But nowadays, things are quite remote. So hopefully it shouldn't. The, the outcome, the experience of that would be really valuable for you as an individual and should be fairly no cost as well. So they're really good. But they, it takes a lot more. I don't know what it is, sort of, you know, drive and determination to create and find and, and secure those types of opportunities. But the, but they do exist. They're just not on the shelf. And I think in that, that context too, like, you know, the WDRF manager, for instance, these busy people out there working in conservation who would probably love someone to come in and help them and just kind of sit next to them and take a bit of the load off. They're often too busy to sit back and and kind of to write the, the volunteer job um, advertisement to list it on the websites to do the shortlist in the interview and it just doesn't happen whereas if you dropped out the blue because you'd researched them and found them online and you knew what they're trying to achieve and how you can help them they might look at you and go oh yeah you're just like you know manna from heaven you know and I, I need i need you come in and help me you know so it's like the busy people need volunteers but they're too busy to find them so you, if you find them and do the work for them You've, I think you've got quite a good chance actually of securing a really high quality experience that's perfectly tailored for you, as good as it can be, at zero cost. So I think that weighs into this discussion of 
inclusion and diversity in the market, which I, I totally sympathize and support. Yeah, but, but I think the underlying assumption is that you need to pay to volunteer or those people get advantage. And I think there's some truth to those people getting an advantage, but there isn't truth to you need to pay to volunteer. I don't support that view myself. There's lots of other ex experiences out there. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I do agree. With, so that's really good advice for people. I definitely support that. But I do, I do think that time is money. And like, mm. you know, if you're a single mom and you have a, a kid, you you don't have time to volunteer. So that's yeah. that's really um, the way that it can exclude people. And I have to say, from my personal experience, I well, it, okay. So I either I think it's it, it's excluding people, and then. It, if it's not, it's putting people in debt. That's that's another big problem mm -hmm. because I I come from a family that um, my dad grew up poor and he was very adverse to risk. <laughs> so like I grew up with that mentality that I didn't want to take all this risk. And if it wasn't for my dad's generosity and support in this career, meaning that like when I had my internships, they didn't all line up perfectly. So I could go home and live with my parents. And I did an internship in Kenya for a year. I I did get paid for it, but I got paid in a Kenyan salary and I had to pay for half of my airfare. So that was a year where I made no money at all. And um, like I said, you know, not everyone can afford to do that where they where they are just not making money if they have to have a kid or something like that. So. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely affecting diversity and excluding people mm. but um and then yeah if it's not then it's putting people in debt like i see people like stephanie talked about it where she did a, a volunteer i think she paid for hers but she was you know thousands of dollars in debt and she's still paying back for it i've heard people spending like twenty thousand dollars and like and and yeah it's a big problem so um that's another thing i try to warn people about is is like be careful about what you choose and and think about the long-term consequences as well mm. yeah, yeah also also in deeper uh, like adding to that i read it i i was trying to look for it but i'm not gonna be able to find it in real time maybe we can add it to some show notes or something <laughs> but the, this is some uh, support school for people that want to enter the job market from from a very uh, tough uh, situation and then they were describing things like okay today we are going to sit down and I'm going to teach you how to do email and then this is how you do email this is when someone says oh I'll drop you an email it means this and then you shouldn't reply all and you shouldn't this and telling you all these inner secrets of people that are more affluent or like in the real world that we think it's for everybody but it's not like coming from from a situation where you haven't had a lot of uh, I don't know you don't know about Clubhouse, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. You don't know about any of those things because you have been serving tables or whatever. Mm -hmm. and those people exist, and the, I found I mean it was a it was an article about this uh, training school for this, and it was eye opening. Like there is so much more diversity and difficult situations down there that we don't know and i guess it's all a gradient of course we want to be as inclusive as possible but it's impossible to include every everybody in this world at the moment and the idea is how how can we create more of these schools how can we create more opportunities for everybody how can we get more funding for conservation so that there is more money to trust people that don't have a lot of experience it's yeah. uh, oof. <laughs> big isn't yeah, we it? need I, money 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 <laughs> is the problem solution. right <laughs> i hadn't i hadn't thought about it like that though no no like you know the, it's almost like the culture the culture within an industry if you don't get or you're not in that culture it immediately Absolutely. labels you as an outsider even as to or if how you, you Email or if you grew up in a developing country too, like, uh -huh. um, you know, my friends in Kenya, they know how to use smartphones and stuff like that, but they're, you know, there's similar ages than me, but they don't, they don't know how to type on a computer or they didn't have the experience growing up typing. And so they're, they're going, um, you know, very slow or they don't know how to write emails. You're so right. I didn't even think about it from that perspective. It's amazing. It's, it's like they are hidden, hidden hindrances <laughs> it's yes. like that we don't think of. 
Yeah, it's... which must heighten this imposter syndrome, which has been talked about a lot recently too, this mm -hmm. feeling of being an outsider. And you need, how do you break through that? How do you get the confidence to break through that and actually, you know, ground yourself in an industry when you feel so far out the loop? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess I do of... think, sorry, go, go ahead. No, go <laughs> I, say, I do think conservation organizations have, have, recognized though that it is so much better to have in-country scientists than or or sorry um staff um rather than you know westerners so i do think that is starting to change and they're they're willing to invest in time and, and money and to do trainings like that because um i mean it's the right thing to do but also there's just so many benefits that they you know they're i mean they're from that country they speak the language they know the people and there's there's more trust built in from the people what towards whatever project they're working on but um but yeah i do think some that some of that stuff is changing a little bit yeah, and they're more sustainable yeah. too, whereas international mm -hmm. staff and the expats will move around. They'll be here for a few years right. and go, you know, in-country staff, although often they might be that brain drain and go elsewhere. Once they get trained up to a certain level, they're more likely to be there in the long term and provide that yeah, mm -hmm. sustainability, yeah, continuity, mm -hmm. yeah, if you like, yeah. That's super important, yes. Yeah. Wow, I feel like we've covered an awful lot. I'm also, yes. I think we're just over an hour of chatting as well. I feel like I could chat for a few more hours about it, but I think we've <laughs> we've, we've talked an awful lot. And it, I've, I've really enjoyed the discussion as well. I mean, thank you guys for, for sharing your thoughts. Um, I feel like we've touched on lots of different subjects, which we could equally go quite deep into. Totally, <laughs> lots of avenues. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure we've got any solutions, but it's such a big area. Um, yeah, where do we start with that one? But uh, thank you guys for sharing your time and jumping in. Um, as a suggestion, maybe at the end of the podcast, I was going to ask, like, maybe we could just share like a piece of advice, an individual piece of advice, like with the audience before we wrap up a piece of like careers advice, like a short thing. Um, is there anything that you that you'd like to and Nando's nodding? So I'm going to go to you already. <laughs> I, I was just thinking about something about this. It's we all want to fix as many things as possible. But I tell you, it's easier from the inside. So first, before before getting into many problems and trying to to be diverse and, and and help a lot, try to get the job first, and then from the inside get that funding and offer that opportunities yourself. Mm -hmm. When you when you get your job in in a in an NGO, create create opportunities for people that cannot afford them, and it will be. If we do it once we are on the other side, quoting again for the podcast, mm -hmm. we, we, ha we will have much more power than doing it. I mean, I guess we can also complain, but, but it's, I think it has more power if you do it from a position of power. So try to mm -hmm. follow all those bits of advice that Stephanie and Nick has said. And, and then once you get up there, remember your origins and your struggles and then push to change from the inside mm. yeah you're so right people at the top need to need to start saying stuff and and trying to change the rules yeah i totally agree yeah uh, have you got any advice you want to share stephanie and that could be related to volunteering or even a bit more broad like a, just a conservation uh, advice tip <laughs> I, my my best advice or my biggest advice is uh, is always to know the job as best as you can um, before before you get started into it and so um, so look at the jobs now so go to go to conservation careers and look at the job postings and and don't just look at the next step like don't look at oh I would love that internship look at like this is ultimately where I want to be in 20 years and then look at what it takes to get there. Because if you want to be a research scientist, like at a nonprofit, like I said, you might need fundraising experience. And so if you're familiar with the, the end goal, then you won't miss the pieces or like the 50% that Nando said, <laughs> you won't miss that 50% and you can get it. Um, outside of your degree program you can volunteer volunteer <laughs> you can volunteer to be part of a fundraiser for any organization or um or social media campaign or whatever their skills are yeah that's great advice too yeah thank you guys um and i think my advice would be and this is a good example of that so i think conservation is a really friendly space and i think people need to remember mm -hmm. that um when they're seeking to enter in whether that whether you're graduating entering the job market that way whether you're a switcher coming across mid-career into the industry from somewhere outside you know there's a place for you too 
And I would encourage you just to kind of reach out and talk to people, you know, and network. So, you know, use LinkedIn, use Google, find people doing interesting jobs that you that you feel passionate about that get you excited and, and reach out and see if you can talk to them about their careers and advice. You know, I know we have a bit of a unique platform, the three of us, and we can talk to people in this way, you know, fairly freely. But in seven years of doing this, I haven't had a single person say no yet, you know, and I, and I think that's fairly typical. I think most people are quite flattered. So don't be scared is my advice. <laughs> find some people to talk to you know reach out to them and, and just have that conversation you'd be amazed where that conversation might lead you to um so i think that's absolutely, pretty absolutely. yeah that's a good place to maybe end up on so um thank you guys again it's been really really fun i've really thank enjoyed you. this i hope you guys it's have too great. thank you exactly as you plan <laughs> we got yeah. into a deep nice conversation <laughs> that's nice and i'm sure we've got many more of these um, should we want to do some yeah um can't wait <laughs> yeah i look forward to it so thanks again. Uh, guys if people want to find out a bit more about you um where should we send them have you got anything you'd like to share just Google fancy scientist and I show up. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you can find me as Bioblogo in social media and it could lead you to places. <laughs> I have like a great. Thank you. All right. Thanks again, guys. Till the next time. We'll cut Thank the edit you. there. Bye. Okay. Well, I hope you enjoyed that, everyone. If you did, then please do hit the subscribe button to get notified of new episodes as they drop. Um, and also please give us a rating or a review because it really helps us to get in front of more people. Now, if you want our help to get clear and get started and get hired as a professional conservationist, I recommend you enroll in our free online training program, exploring how to get a conservation job. So if you're a student, a job seeker or a career switcher, you'll learn the golden rule about how to get started, the key mistakes to avoid, and also we'll answer your biggest questions. You can check that out at conservation hyphen careers.com forward slash free. See you soon.